Ports of Call. horizons far at the world's end, strange, fascinating lands beckon us, bid us revel in their exotic splendors. Come with us as we head for Port of Call. Come with us across the Pacific, across the China Sea, where Asia points the narrow finger of the Malay Peninsula toward the fabled isles of the Indies. There we find our Port of Call, Siam. From Singapore, our steamer plows northward up the strait to Penang, a picturesque port which sprawls torpid in the tropic sun. There we disembark to take a train of the Federated Malay States Railroad bound for Bangkok. Bangkok, the Venice of the Orient, interlaced with numberless canals or clongs, a city of amazing contradictions, of broad avenues and luxurious buildings, of miserable hovels and squalid, muddy lanes, a crossroad of humanity set at the end of the earth. Here are placid Chinese and swarthy Malays, suave Europeans from the legations, and tanned young Englishmen and Americans down for a holiday from the teak forests to the north. And everywhere the yellow robes of the priests, bright symbols of the gentle Buddha of long ago. But suppose we rejoin our fellow travelers in the hotel lounge at the end of their first day in Bangkok. Oh, I'm tired. What a day. Where did you go, my dear? Oh, just everywhere. I feel like Alice in Wonderland when she said, Curiouser and Curiouser. <laughs> we were over on the left bank in the Talat Clou, the betel leaf market. Oh. And I was looking at a little good luck charm, and the storekeeper practically made me buy it. He almost gave it to me because he said I had a lucky face. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not all. We were crossing one of the smaller canals while the tide was out, and the bottom was all mud. And there were fish actually walking along on their fins. Oh, come now, aren't you pulling our leg a bit? No, on my honor. And the guide told me about another fish that captures insects by spitting at them. <laughs> and he wanted me to bet on a fight between two minnows. <laughs> Funny about superstitions here. My guide was convinced there was a ghost in every tree. And he was in a very devil of a predicament. Seems as a specially sacred tree. So sacred that it's forbidden to have one in a private garden. But the blooming thing sows itself far and wide. And the poor chap's got one in his garden and doesn't know what to do. It's against his faith to have one, and it's against his faith to pull one up. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing country. Oh, it certainly is. I've worked my camera overtime all day. Too bad they built so many European-type houses on this side of the canal, though. Oh, but there's still a lot of the old Siamese style, on stilts with broad verandas and such paneling. And there's funny roofs, like pagodas. Well, I'd like to stay longer, but I'm off to Chiang Mai in the morning. 27 hours by rail. It sounds like the end of the world. Probably quite decent. All the teak fellows get in regularly. There's golf and tennis and polo and the right enough club for tiffin. And those American cocktails. <laughs> Trouble is, a chap probably gets bored after a while. Same faces all the time, you know. Oh, but I could never be bored with Siam. It's too amazing. <laughs> Mm. 
Siam. The name calls forth an image of yellow rivers and stagnant canals, of forgotten temples drowsing in the matted jungle. Siam, land of the white elephant, so remote and aloof from the world that she seems changeless, one of the things which always was and always will be. Yet, let us unroll the scroll of the past. Six centuries before Christ, Chinese history records wars with the barbarians, the Tai people who lived south of the Yangtze Kiang. In later centuries, the Tai people formed the powerful kingdom of Nan Chao and continued their wars with China until they were finally conquered by the great Kublai Khan in 1253. This conquest resulted in a wholesale emigration to the inhospitable jungles of the south, where the remnants of the Tai people exterminated the original inhabitants or destroyed the strain by intermarriage. Thus was Siam founded, to doze in obscurity until one summer in 1612. Then at Patani, Behold, from the great white-winged canoe, a smaller canoe has taken sail and heads for the shore. Once before, such a canoe came out of the endless water. Oh, I believe it not. Nevertheless, it is true. The husband of my third sister saw it. Those who manned the canoe were white of skin and fair of hair. They bore rare gifts, which they were willing to trade for such trifles as ivory, jade, and teakwood. The strangers approach the shore. Make her fast, lad. Aye, aye, sir. All right, gentlemen, we'll disembark. Keep an eye on those heathen. Never can tell. Heathen land or not, sir. Feels good underfoot after such a voyage. At least I'll wager they've got fresh water and fruit. Welcome to our humble shores and greetings. Greetings to you. I am Captain Anthony Hippon of the good ship Globe lying yonder. And from whence do you come? From England. England? I know it not. Nor do I. My country is far away beyond the sea. Beyond Burma? Aye, beyond Burma. Many, many days beyond. Mm, what brings you to our shores? Trade. We would trade that which we bring for those things you have. I would build a post here and leave my companion, Peter Flores, to conduct the trading. What think you? It is a matter for the king. Aye. I would visit your king. I bear greeting to him from my sovereign. Song Tam, may he live forever, is at Ayutia. Then the globe sets sails for Ayutia at once, Flores. Yes, sir. You and Burke and Jarvis remain here and build a post. When I return, I'll have a charter. You are prompt, Captain Ipan. It is not quite time for the audience. When His Majesty is gracious enough to grant an audience, what man would not be prompt? Captain Ipan, I do not know the custom in your country, but in our country, when the king approaches, one must prostrate himself. So. I understand. His illustrious highness, Song Tam, brother of the sun and the moon, lord of the forests and rivers, guardian of the hundred white elephants. Illustrious highness. Your majesty. You may rise. Captain Hippon, you are welcome to my kingdom. You may sit at my right hand. Your Majesty, I bring words of greeting from my sovereign, James I of England. So, your king has heard of me? Yes, Your Majesty. The splendors of your court and the glories of your reign are known to him. It is well. Your Majesty? Yes, Captain Hippon. There is a matter of commerce. You may speak. Nature has lavished upon Siam goods which we of England have not. Rare woods and spices and gems. And on my ship I carry English goods not known in your country. I wish to establish a post for trading to our mutual benefit. I am sorry, Captain Hippon, but Siam has ever been sufficient to herself. It is better so. Everywhere in Siam I have heard the people refer to your majesty as the just king. It pleases me that my subjects have so named me. And there are wars to be waged? Yes. Always there are wars with our neighbors of Burma and Cambodia. Wars cost many tickles which the people may pay in taxes. It is ever so, though I like not to tax my people too heavily. A plan has come to me. I propose to establish trade in such a manner that the revenues will accrue to your majesty. Thus, there will be no jealousy among your subjects. 
and the revenues from European trade will enable your majesty to carry on the wars without taxing the people. For achieving victory over your enemies, without the burden of taxation, you will indeed be proclaimed the just king. You are persuasive, Captain Hippon. I am minded to open trade on the conditions you suggest. If your majesty will grant a charter, It why... shall be done. In what name shall I give this charter? The name matters little. Suppose we call it the British East India Company. <laughs> And so was organized the great British East India Company, an empire within an empire, a corporation which was to play an all-important part in the colonial development of England. The land of the white elephant had become another pawn in the game of empire. The game of empire. It was a sport for titans. The real players were old men in London, Paris, Amsterdam. But missionaries and traders were their puppets. The rules of the game were simple. To tilt the balance of power toward one's own country. To see how well they played, one has but to look at the map of Asia today. Look at the map of Asia and see little Siam, independent, surrounded by European colonies. A white elephant is an unwieldy pawn. Late in the 17th century, the British and French were bitterly opposed for control of Siam, while the Dutch, already tightening their hold upon the Indies, dreamed of gaining that control for themselves while the traditional enemies were deadlocked. Into this picture of intrigue and diplomacy came Falcon the Barcelon. Born in Greece, Falcon ran away from home and became a cabin boy at the age of 10. In 1675, he arrived in Siam as a trader. He rescued a shipwrecked Siamese ambassador to Persia, and through this circumstance, became superintendent of foreign trade and later minister of finance and practical dictator under King Narai. And with growing power, the number of his enemies grew. King Narai and Bra Petraja, heir to the throne, are seated in the audience chamber. You may speak. Your Majesty, it is the Honorable John Wellman of the British East India Company who would address you. He may do so, Pra Petraja. You may address His Majesty. Your Majesty. On behalf of the British East India Company, I ask that our vessels be granted the same privileges in the port of Mergui as are granted the French. That is the matter for the Barcelon. But, uh, if Your Majesty please, Falcon the Barcelon is antagonistic to my company's interests. Possibly he has reason for that antagonism. Mm. I remember not many years ago when the British East India Company was itself, shall we say, antagonistic to Falcon the Barcelon. He was not so important then. Uh, your Majesty will not grant what we ask? I neither grant nor deny. You must see Falcon the Barcelon. But your Majesty... The I... audience is ended. Mm, uh, may your Majesty live forever. Fra Petraja, I have told you not to bother me with such trifles. Illustrious Highness, you know my loyalty. I do. Then may my loyalty permit me to speak boldly. Speak? Among the Europeans, and among our own people, it is said that Narai is king in name only. That Falcon, the foreigner, is really king. Ha! Ah, such idle mouthings are fit only for toothless hags. I have given Falcon much power, and he has used it wisely. But the concessions he grants to the French... The French pay well for those concessions. I fear that it is Siam that will pay dearly in the end. Trapetraja... Falcon the Barcelon is my trusted minister. He has served me well. If you are loyal to me... I would prove my loyalty with my life. If you are loyal to me, you must pledge to Falcon the same loyalty as long as I live. I pledge loyalty to Falcon the Barcelon as long as you live. The conflict between British and French interests for the control grew steadily in intensity, with Falcon, because of his hatred of the British East India Company, inclining more and more to the French. Then one significant day, Colbert, Louis XIV's minister to Siam, calls at Falcon's palace in high spirits. Falcon, mon ami, I have news, happy news. And what is that? His Majesty Louis has bestowed upon you a great honor. 
Behold. Hmm. I do not read your language very well. What does it say? With this greeting, Louis makes you a count of the court of France. How does that sound, eh? Le Comte Falcon, Chevalier de France. Le Comte Falcon. That sounds very good. Much better than Falcon the cabin boy or Falcon the filibuster factor. A count of the French court. That will give those stiff Englishmen something to think about. In his letter, Louis calls you his friend. He knows your worth, even if the English do not. Falcon the friend of a king of France. Ah. I must send his majesty a fine gift to show that Falcon appreciates the honor he has bestowed upon me. What shall it be now? Carved ivory, perhaps, or some ancient jade from the temples? Uh, I have a still better idea. What is that? You know, of course, how the accursed British have been trying to win away the French trade concessions in the ports of Bangkok and Mergui. They have tried, but I have blocked them every time. I have a plan that will block them for good, and will at the same time show your appreciation to Louis. What is the plan? Deed the ports of Bangkok and Mergui to France. Really, my friend Colbert, that seems drastic, does it not? Oh, man, no, it's really just a matter of form. You deed these ports to France. You, as Count of France, retain control. Holding these ports, France would have to pay for their defense. Saving money for Siam, yet affording the same outlets for Siamese goods. What do you say? Well, the nobles would rise in anger. They had to me and off as it is. Oh, what do you care? You are the minister. Already they plot against me. Proper treasure and the others, they plot and they wait their time. But you are nearest the king's ear. And what I suggest is for best of Siam. Oh, the nobles will not think so. But it will drive the British East India Company from Siam. Falcon has never feared to take a bold step. You may inform his majesty that in recognition of the honor he has conferred upon me, I deed to him the ports of Bangkok and Mergui. <laughs> With the announcement of these astounding concessions to the French, resentment against Falcon flares openly in the Siamese court, and only the staunch support of King Narai saves the Barcelon. Dark undercurrents of plotting and intrigue flow everywhere, and Falcon's downfall is the objective of every plot. Secure in the confidence of the king and the promised protection of the French, Falcon pays little heed to his enemies until King Narai is suddenly seized by dropsy. In his palace, Falcon awaits word of the expected arrival of the French, whom he has summoned to assist him. Rapatraja will not dare to strike until the king is dead. Ah, well, no use to worry. Tana, bid the cooks prepare a meal. Some fish with rice and curry and spices and some shredded coconut. Did you hear me? I said, bid the cooks prepare a meal. Hurry or I'll have you flogged. Why, oh, I, I cannot, master. What do you mean? The servants have all left. They, they were afraid. Left? Ah, let them leave. They'll learn that Falcon isn't beaten yet, you miserable scum. When the French arrive, I... What is that? Seize the Barcelona! Uh, 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 is he made fast? Yes, Highness. What does this mean? You are held for treason. Uh, when the king hears the of king this... He knows of it. I am king. You mean... Exactly. Narai is dead. Ah, uh, but I am innocent of treason, Papa Traja. No need to worry, Falcon. I'm not going to kill you just yet. <sighs> that information pleases you, does it not? It might please you less if I were to tell you the French soldiers are not coming to your rescue. No, but the French are my friends. I am a Count of France. Indeed. But the French commander, Defarge, is also a man of fine discretion. He was turned back by news of Nelai's death. He knew he could only arrive too late to save you. Oh, but I am innocent, I tell you. Punish me if you will, but spare my life. I shall spare your life, my good friend. I shall spare it long enough to devise a suitable method of killing you. Oh, proper treasure. Don't, no, don't. Kill me if you must, but let it be swift. You may be certain, Falcon that I shall kill you in as horrible a manner as I can devise. I don't... And your death will be a signal for the slaying or expulsion of every European in the nation. <laughs> it will be Pla Petraja's message to the world that Siam is for the Siamese.
So ended the most serious threat of European domination of Siam. Throughout his reign, Pra Patraj continued a vigorous policy of European persecution. Missionaries were imprisoned and driven from the country. The ceded ports were regained. Both French and English garrisons were destroyed. Finally, only a very few Dutch and Portuguese remained on sufferance. Siam was again sufficient unto herself, living in a world apart, a world not unlike that of the Arabian Nights. Throughout the years, little change occurred to quicken the pulse of the white elephant. Small brown men continued to fish the muddy, jungle-lined rivers. Other brown men in robes of blue, green, orange, and yellow walked the streets of Bangkok. During the World War, Siam sent a small but efficient force to fight on the side of the Allies. Into the Treaty of Versailles, Woodrow Wilson forced a clause guaranteeing the sovereignty of Siam. In 1925, Pajaripak ascended the elephant throne, slight, earnest man in whom the ancient culture of the East was adorned with the trappings of Western education. In June 1932, while the king was away on a holiday, the army and navy, under the leadership of Colonel Fai Faho, poured into Bangkok and seized the reins of government. Pashalipak hurriedly returns to confer with the revolutionary leader. What does this mean, Colonel? The army is in control, Your Highness. The princes who head your departments of state have been imprisoned. There was no bloodshed. And I? Am I also imprisoned? No, Your Highness. The army does not wish to take you from the throne. What, then, is it that you wish? We have drawn up a constitution which we request you to sign. It will give Siam a modern constitutional government, with myself as premier. For a long while, I have sought the means to give the people control of the government. This is the aim of the constitution, Your Highness. But... I should not wish a military dictatorship. Under the Constitution, the army will remain the servant of your highness and of the people. When my dynasty was founded 150 years ago, it was predicted that it would end in this year. The Constitution, your highness. The prediction is fulfilled. I will sign. In September 1934, while the king was living in elm-shaded Knowles House in Surrey, England, recuperating from a cataract operation, the National Assembly of Siam demanded that he surrender his monarchical power of life and death, which had been allowed him by the Constitution. He refused under threat of abdication. On March 2nd, 1935, delegates of the Siamese government again visit Surrey. <laughs> Has your majesty reconsidered his refusal to relinquish the power of life and death? You mean the power of pardon? As your majesty pleases. His national assembly is not unreasonable. We do not wish that you completely re relinquish your present right to pardon anyone convicted of death within 60 days after a sentence. We merely ask that you share that power with the premier. So that in the case of political prisoners, the premier need only to continue the argument 60 days, and the execution would take place against my wishes. No, I will not submit to such a dictatorship. In that event, Your Highness... I have already prepared my abdication. I am too ill to help and protect my people, and I cannot allow any party to carry on the administration this way under cover of my name. I have tried to give the people a real voice in the policy of the country. They didn't get it. I abdicate in favor of my nephew, Prince Ananda Mahidal. Your Highness. I am Your Highness no longer. <laughs> that reminds me. Maybe the English and American newspapers will stop referring to me as Brother of the Moon and Prince of the Twenty-Four. Umbrellas. Eleven-year-old Prince Ananda Mahido is at school in Switzerland when a frock-coated delegation calls upon him to inform him he is King of Siam. Your Highness. Your Highness. Reply to the gentleman like a good boy. 
How do you do, gentlemen? The formalities are very simple. If your highness will just read a brief statement which we have presumed to prepare. Read it aloud, Ananda. Uh, it is with a deep sense of responsibility that I accept this honor which has been bestowed upon me. I pledge myself to serve my country faithfully to support the co constitutional. Co constitutional government. In accepting the throne of Siam, I dedicate my life to the service of its people. May I go out and play now, mademoiselle? Is uh, that all, gentlemen? Yes, that is all. You can play now, Ananda, but not for long. Say goodbye to the gentlemen. Goodbye. Your Highness. Your Highness. We must cable Bangkok at once. Yes. <laughs> goodbye, mademoiselle. But why are you crying? No, oh, it's silly. I know, gentlemen. You'll pardon me, but he's such a little king. <laughs> New horizons beckon, and we depart from the land of the white elephant. Our minds a kaleidoscope of fragrant lotus blossoms on slimy pools. Peasants bathing openly to proudly display the luxury of soap. Grave little dancers like grotesque dolls in the temples. And as we leave Bangkok and follow the Yellow River to the sea, we realize that while kings and governments are fleeting things, the rivers and the jungles and the temples are ageless and unchanging. And they are Siam. A strange, far country in the modern world, but not of it. I invite you to join us again next week at this time as we journey to another of the world's fascinating ports of call.